grouped and organized by our question team as they come in. All participants will be automatically muted. Um, if you want to ask a question, you type it into the chat function and we will pick up your questions as we go. They will be molded together and presented to Howard for answers, which we will sprinkle through the webinar. Please type your questions as clearly as you can, and we will answer them as we're able. The webinar will be recorded, and recording has started, and we will be placing it on our YouTube channel here at EI, which will be accessible through our website. So it's great to have you all here, and we will also have country participants who are part of the case studies within the report, and they will be talking about their particular country case studies. So without further ado, I'd like to introduce Howard Stevenson, who is Professor of Education at Nottingham University. He's been a teacher and a union researcher for many years. He's a co-author of the study with Nina Bassia and a fellow Mancunian. So it's great to have you here, Howard. And if you can start by telling us a little bit about the research. Uh, thank you, Martin, and uh, thank you for the introduction and for the opportunity to uh, be here and part of uh, to, to share with you the work <laughs> with uh, my colleague Nina Bassia, who's at the University of Toronto. Nina uh, can't participate in this, unfortunately, but uh, we work together. Uh, the research is looking at how teacher unions in different parts of the world are facing up to particular challenges. Some of those challenges, uh, they often look particular to the context of each individual union. But I think when you look at those cases and you look at those challenges, in a sense, I think wherever you are in the world, you will see uh, issues that resonate with your own experience. So um, I know Nina feels the same, but it was a privilege for us to be able to work with the unions that we did. Uh, we worked in Chile with the Colegio de Profesores. Uh, we worked in the United States with both AFT and NEA. We worked in Scotland with the Educational Institutes of Scotland. We worked in New Zealand with both the union representing primary teachers and the unions representing the union representing secondary teachers. We worked in Poland with the ZNP, with Ertim Sen in Turkey, and with the Kenyan National Union of Teachers. So we worked uh, across those countries. I'd just like to take this opportunity to really thank all those unions who we work with. Uh, who were enormously supportive and helpful in the work that we did. I feel guilty sometimes because I get the chance to travel around and talk about this research. And I'm very conscious that I'm sort of uh, living, living off the experience and the work of the people who are really doing the job. So I'm really pleased that in this, um, in this webinar, those organizations, some of those organizations who we worked with are represented today and we'll hear from them directly. And I think that's really, really important. So um, that's the work that we've done, Martin. It was it's over 18 months where we worked with these uh, different organizations. I think EI has done a great job in uh, in presenting the work in the report that it has done, and I'm delighted to see it in several languages. And what we hope now is that we can just uh, look, we all know, everyone listening to this webinar knows there are no easy answers to these big questions. But what we hope is that this report can help us collectively have a discussion about what some of those answers might look like. Because I think what we became very aware of whilst we were involved in the research is that we need to just get better at learning from each other. There is so much we can learn from each other. We need to get better at doing that. OK, now on a housekeeping issue, I would ask you all to remain muted. Um, Ahmed is going to unmute those who are speaking and that will happen piece by piece. I will do a shout out to SNTE who copied a whole number of the Spanish version of the report for their people in order to make sure that the conversation in organising unions was going on 
within their country in Mexico in a way that was active and engaging and able to draw people into the discussion. And it is around the discussion that I'm going to turn my questioning now. I'd like to know, Howard, what are the challenges facing teachers and their unions? Why do you think we need to think about renewal? Okay. Uh, this, these are these issues which I think uh, face teachers everywhere, look different in different places, but which actually we are all facing up to in, in, in different ways. And in the report, we identify uh, five challenges that, that uh, spoke to us very strongly, that they were around increasing workload of teachers, deprofessionalization, uh, privatization, uh, attacks on workers' rights, which we see in very many places, sometimes very explicitly, sometimes uh, uh, less visible, but, but still happening. And there are big changes in the way that we, uh, we think about our profession and teaching as a career. Uh, changes in technology, the, the way people live their lives. It's more than just teaching, but uh, they present significant challenges to people who organise in unions. If I was to sort of think of a way of trying to summarise that, I think it would be talking about the rising expectations globally on education systems. If you think about the world that we live in at this particular moment in time, uh, I mean, look, in my lifetime, it feels like uh, as, as troubled a time as I can remember. Uh, the world feels a particularly uncertain place. Uh, in many ways, it feels like a dangerous place, frankly. Uh, we're living in difficult times and we're facing up to really uh, big questions about what sort of world that we live in and the, and the future direction of that world. Uh, it's a, it's a globalised world in which uh, so much emphasis is put on, for example, that sort of notion of economic competitiveness. And, and the reason why I'm sort of talking about these issues, because whether it's economic competitiveness or whether it's uh, some of the big social issues that we face in this very sort of complicated world that we live in, expectations about how we resolve those issues are increasingly placed on educational institutions. I mean, we've always looked to educational institutions to sort of sort that, I say sort those problems out, but you know what I mean by that, to, to, to address those issues. But in a, in a world that uh, feels like it's shrinking, but is moving faster and faster, uh, but is more and more complicated, and, and, the, and the challenges and the problems and some of the conflicts within that are greater and greater, it's as though the the bigger those challenges facing us in the world in which we live, the greater the expectations being placed on educational institutions. And when we use a phrase like the expectations on educational institutions, of course, what we mean is the people who work and study in those institutions feel the weight of those increased expectations. So, for example, in the work that we did, uh, an issue that we came across absolutely everywhere was rising workload. That teachers are facing a sort of an inexorably increasing pressure to work longer and longer, uh, to work harder and harder, uh, to, to be, you know, to pack more work into the hours that they do. Because, of course, if we turn the world in which we live in, in into a sort of global economic race, which is, I think, how uh, many people present that sort of concept of globalisation. Education becomes the means by which apparently that competitiveness is going to be secured. And education acts as this sort of magic bullet. So, of course, if we don't do well in that race, we, have, we, we begin to turn education into a race. So what can unions do about it, Howard? You know, well, what that, does it look like? So that, that puts more and more pressure on teachers. That's why they see their working hours increasing. But at the same time, 
the governments that are trying to get more and more out of teachers because they they want to rise up these international league tables that we increasingly uh, obsess about they can't at the same time resist wanting to take more control over what happens in schools so it's not just that working hours are increasing but that actually teachers have less and less control over how they determine their own work so there's simultaneously uh, what came across in the study was these sort of twin pressures of increasing workload and decreasing we might call it professional autonomy or space for professional judgment. So teachers are both having to work harder and harder, but feeling more and more frustrated in their work. And that's the, that's the sort of massive bind that, that faces teachers in lots of different places. Uh, and which is, which is in many parts of the world causing enormous pressures in terms of the recruitment of teachers. So it, it's not just in one or two countries that you've got problems of teacher recruitment it's in lots of different places because those same pressures are there and of course what you see there and, and which i think is sort of a key theme in the study is if i talk about increasing workload and i talk about teachers more and more being told what to teach and how to teach what we see there is the sort of complete integration of what are sometimes called industrial issues and professional issues. They're not separate. They're one and the same. So to a teacher, it's work. So how does the, the union, how does the um, SNTE in Mexico or the CTF in Canada or whoever it is actually respond to this pressure? because you're asking them to do quite a number of things at the same time. What is the, um, what is the pathway to renewal? How can a union get in the position where they're able to have more influence on right. government? So just to sort of slightly unpick what I was saying a moment ago, the consequences of those developments are increased pressure on teachers. They're working longer, uh, they're feeling more frustrated in their work. They're feeling more constrained and controlled in their work. So that pushes up the pressure on teachers. Unions, as the organisations that represent teachers, are, are expected in the sense to be the organisations that respond to those pressures. The point I'm making is increasing pressure on teachers means increasing pressure on unions. So, and this is, this is the, this is, key i think to understanding why renewal is so critical because the pressure on unions is increasing so in a sense the resources that it needs to respond to those pressures is increasing but actually there aren't many unions that can easily draw on the resources to meet the increase in demand in fact, in some cases, those resources might be diminishing because of the attacks that we see on unions in some parts of the world. So there's an increase in the demand on unions. There's an increase in the need for unions to support their members. There's, an there's a demand for greater resources to address those issues. The resources available to meet that demand are unlikely to be sufficient. Unions, therefore, and, and what we say in the report is unions have to find a way to make good that gap. If there isn't a, you know, a magic supply of resources that unions can draw on, they have to think hard about where that resource is. And that resource, our argument is, is it's in the membership. Now, unions have always done this it's what unions are about. What we're saying is unions need to take more seriously the notion of developing the membership. How do they do that, Howard? And, and I would remind all our listeners that you can be writing questions in the chat function for Howard as we're presenting, and we will deal with them as they come up. We already have a number of questions here, but for those of you who come across issues that you want to ask questions directly on, enter them into the chat function and they will be picked up.
here at Education International. Now back to you, Howard. The question of how you mobilizing and organizing your members in a way which makes a difference. You talk in the report about controlling the narrative and you talk about different ways that that happens. It happens through union organization. It happens through the uh, members' ability to organize the union. And, and it's a two-way process. Do you want to talk about some of the platforms, social media, the, the, their ability to connect, et cetera, that are going on? Right. So that notion of... Uh, so our argument in the report is that unions need to tap into the collective strength that is their membership. Now, in a sense, unions have always done that. But the imperative, the, re, the renewal imperative, I think, is that I, I think be, because of those challenges that I talked about, because, because the pressures on the profession are now so great, it requires uh, a sort of bigger commitment to that notion of renewal, connecting with teachers. And I think this is where we've got to maybe shift the thinking a little bit, because you know, we have a sort of traditional notion of what the union activist looks like, what, what the union activist does. Uh, and those people are really important. They do great work. Uh, they, have, they are what keep unions going. In the report, we talk in a sense, I think, about trying to build that. You know, the, the pool of existing activists is not going to be enough for the teaching profession to be able to respond to those challenges that are coming at us now and will only get bigger in the future. You're talking about activists in the traditional sense. So I think we have to move from thinking about union activists to, to what Judith Sachs, the Australian uh, academic colleague, talked about as an activist profession. Okay. It's about teachers realising that they can only be the teacher they want to be, working in the system that they want to work in, if they act collectively. So at the young do that, and, 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 if, and, and the vehicle for doing that is the union, that the union is indispensable to them being the teacher that they want to be. Now, that, that goes beyond, in a sense, I think, a narrow notion of activism. Important, really important as that is. But it's about bringing more people into that sort of connection with the union. Um, and that can look very different and maybe different to the ways that we've thought about it. So, for example, if I'm a, if I'm a teacher, I may never go to a union meeting. I may never go to that meeting, which is down the road, you know, uh, at the end of a day when I'm exhausted teaching, I can't face the idea of sitting in a meeting. And so, I'd, but I might be going to some union organized professional development, or I might be uh, doing something with the union online or whatever. The, the point is, those are the sorts of activities that start to connect people to the union. And, they, and it develops this, what, what in the report we talk about as union eightness. And union eightness is this notion of the union being sort of indivisible from my professional identity as a teacher. You know, I'm not a, I'm not a teacher here and a union person here. I can't be the teacher I want to be without being in the union and working through the union. But what that working with and through the union looks like might look very different for different people. So what you talked about at the Young Teachers Seminar we had here in Brussels, I remember there was an Argentinian colleague who spoke about the fact that when you become a teacher in Argentina, you join the union, that it was a natural and, and completely accepted part of becoming a professional. And that's what you're talking about, isn't it, with union eightness? It is, it is. It, it's that I join the union, Right. And what I think we need to be working towards is the notion that people aren't, don't just, they're not just members, but they participate in the union. That the union actually develops them, builds their capacities, gives them collective confidence, 
develops their sense of agency and control. And where this works really well is that when people are in their working roles, they see the union as an essential part of them being able to do the job in the way they want to do it. And you know, your point earlier on, Martin, about uh, you know, a world of social media and, and th things of that nature, th this, this is one of the ways the world is sort of becoming more complicated. And we see lots of teachers involved in social media and engaging in social media. And you know, we need to recognize there's different ways now in which people might think about working with other people. But there is no substitute for the union as an independent organization, which is collective and democratic. There is no other way of organizing collectively. Teachers have to organize collectively to be able to do what they want to do in their work. They have to organize collectively. Actually, there's no other vehicle for doing that. Uh, sorry, that the only the union can really do that. Okay. There's lots of other ways people can work with other teachers. I'm not, I'm not suggesting that's not the case, but only the union can really deliver for them around the issues that are really central to their work. Okay, well, that's a relief since we're all unionists here on this webinar. So it's good to know that we've got a, a crucial role to play here in making sure that we can make a difference. We actually have a whole number of, of questions that have come in. And I'm going to start with the question here, which comes from one of our affiliates. So how can unions work with political parties from different parts of the political spectrum? Well, look, uh, you, that's a tough one to start with. Thank you. <laughs> thank you very much for whoever sent that one. Um, unions. Part of what came across in the study, I think, was the challenges of how to work constructively, for example, with governments or employers. Sometimes that's the same thing. Uh, so you're trying to work constructively with and at the same time, make sure that members' interests are supported. And that's a very sort of, that can be a very fine line. And look, there's, a, there's so many contextual issues here, aren't there? Because uh, in some contexts, that might be uh, a, an easier process to manage. In some situations where governments are particularly hostile, you know, trying to develop any sort of constructive relationship is, is a challenge. Unions representing teachers have to work with a range of employers. Uh, so, in a, in a sense, being able to, to work across those different environments is important. Uh, I think one of the things that came across in the study was, and this is where union, uh, uh, this notion of union ateness and union connection is really important, because I, th I think what came across in the study was the importance of, of communication within the union and, and being able to use the uh, democratic structures to help people. These are really difficult issues sometimes for people to understand from afar. Uh, and so a sort of notion of transparency and democracy. Unions are democratic organisations. And it's, I think, about using the democratic structures of the union to, uh, to help people understand what those relationships with employers and governments look like. Uh, you know, I'm, very, I'm always very conscious as an academic that it's sort of easy for me to study these things and really difficult for the people who are doing the work because they are the super fine judgments about, uh, you know, when to when to decide to move forward together and when to decide to make a stand. So I'm not going to uh, tell anybody how to do that. And that's a people have to decide that for themselves in their own circumstances. Um, but the notion of working broadly across is just something that unions have to do, isn't it? OK, we've got quite a few questions backing up here. So I'm going to give you a couple of questions. And um, we do want this to be an interactive process. So we're keen to get questions um, coming in as we go. So we're going to break and have blocks of questions throughout the webinar. Um, I've got a couple here. This is an interesting one. 
while the challenge is to keep a high level of education, what can we as the union do to answer public authorities when the cost of education and training teachers is a problem for liberal governments in a market economy? Now, before you go into that one, I'm going to give you the second question as well. What industrial issues have dominated union work and culture and how is that changing for union members? What are the links that they have across the industrial and the political? So we'll take those two and we are after that going to go to some of our affiliates and Kathy's up first. So if she's ready in a couple of minutes, we will pass to her. So Howard. Right. OK. Uh, <laughs> and as I say, look, these are <laughs> these are difficult questions that we're all wrestling with. Uh, I mean, my interest, in a sense, is is what is it that unions can do to build their capacity to be able to engage in these sorts of debates in a, in a way that carries with it the authority, which which maximises the collective voice of the teaching profession. Uh, now, I think the first question. Uh, raises an important issue about, frankly, some of the changes that are taking place in the profession about, and the questions that are being raised about how we train and prepare people for the profession. For the profession. One of the challenges that we identify in the report is the challenge of privatisation. Uh, and I think implicit in the question, as you presented it there, Martin, is the notion that actually there are these enormous pressures now to try to drive down public spending and public investment. And of course, what we know is there's a whole bunch of people and organisations who are, in a sense, wanting to promote a narrative that public education is failing because they want to fill that space uh, by introducing the private sector. And I think this is I think this is where the notion of uh, framing the narrative or shaping the discourse. That's the sort of language we use in the report, where unions working with others have to be very effective at making the really powerful case for high quality public education. You know, the alternatives that are being presented are a sort of training on the cheap model. And of course, where all these issues come together, which is the politics of education, the professional issues, and the industrial issues, if you like, is that, you know, what's, what's going on at this point in time? There is increasingly a model of teaching, which is about training people relatively cheaply, working them incredibly hard, burning them out, and then replacing them. And of course, in order for that to work, you need this cheap, fast model of being able to bring people in as fast as you're burning people out. Now, it's completely unsustainable and it's immoral. You know, there are huge numbers of teachers in many different parts of the world who, whose, whose lives have been broken by what teaching has done to them. And the sort of unsustainable model of teaching that, that we saw in many different places when we were part of this study. It's what Andy Hargreaves and Michael Fullen call a sort of business capital model of, uh, you know, of how we see teaching. And the challenge for teacher unions, I think, is to, is to reframe that. There is no cheap way to address these issues. So we're not having a Walmart system of teaching. And I'm going to jump in Go there, on. Howard, because we've got to get other people into right. the webinar. But um, it's, it's really clear. There was a question came for EI as well that Mexico has included the right to education in its constitution. Are there other countries that have included the right to education in their legislation at the highest level? And we've got an answer here. While primary education is enshrined in around 81% of constitutions worldwide, there are many countries where this is not yet the case. Education International and its members around the world are working tirelessly so that public quality free education is a right for all and on that question you rose um you uh, you brought forward the the issue of the work that our unions are doing and we have some stunning examples in the case studies so at this point i'm going to pass to kathy who is going to be followed by stacy and carrie 
to talk about a study which has taken place of affiliates in Minnesota, where AFT and NEA have been working together in a unified fashion in order to reprofessionalize and re-energize the work that's going on there. So, Kathy. Hey, good morning. Can everyone hear me? Are we good? Yes. Are we good? Okay. So, uh, I just want to take a minute to thank Educational International for actually connecting the world of research and the world of practice here. It's something that we've been advocating for at the AFT, and we see a lot of uh, a lot of information and a lot of, uh, I love the way Howard put it, uh, learning from each other, uh, things that we have to really prioritize more than we do. So in the United States, uh, teachers understand that unions matter. Um, and we at the American Federation of Teachers, as you can well imagine, are fighting, and you, I'm, I know you know about it, uh, against uh, uh, Trump and DeVos's really existential threats to public education. Um, we're having success. Trump's education budget is stalled in Congress. It presented severe cuts to our most vulnerable students in our most, uh, in our most at risk communities. And DeVos's power to advance a privatization agenda is being checked even by her own uh, party in Congress. So she is not, uh, she is not following through on that. Um, how we've, how we've accomplished this uh, is I think really uh, I, I get, really with the adage and the action of fighting back, but fighting forward. Um, it's a term that our leader, Randy Weingarten, uses all the time. Uh, let me try to paint a picture of what it looks like for you. Um, I think our, our, most, our most success in our urban areas has been a result of our building, funding, and staffing a community engagement strategy in our big cities where our members, our school communities and students, they're feeling the effects of budget cuts, of, of misguided school reform, uh, on top of the increased threats of privatization. Um, political activism uh, among our members and relationship building with our political leaders with a purposeful focus on member engagement around what matters most to teachers in their daily lives. Um, our members are talking to political leaders at the local, state and national level around what they need in the classroom to successfully teach kids. And this, this has informed a narrative, as I described, as fighting back but fighting forward. So a couple of things. Um, the Two national minutes, Kathy. Two, Two minutes. minutes. Okay, Two minutes. got it. The national staff works directly with our local and state federations to fight against budget cuts for services for kids um, in the name of protecting ch children's well-being. Um, we support our state federations as they advance legislation and supports for what we call community schools. So our teachers tell us that paying attention to kids' medical and social needs at the school level really advances student learning. So a big piece of our, a big piece of our advocacy, and you'll hear it when we talk to Education Minnesota, is advancing the idea of community schools. Um, We've also been have uh, have our local unions supported the idea of teacher leadership in professional learning and collaborative decision making, and we have such we're supporting several legislative initiatives advancing teacher leadership in these areas. Um, these the the unions that are advancing this and the national union advancing this, we believe guarantees teachers the professional supports they need in the classroom. To do, to do their everyday work. So profession, teacher-led professional learning. Um, okay, we'll have to round you up there, Kathy, because sure. we've got to pass on Go to your mate, Stacy. So Kathy is on our uh, Education International Research Institute board, as is the person about to follow her, who is Stacy from NEA. Thank you, Kathy, for opening our country cases. Stacy. Have you unmuted yet? Okay. There we go. Okay, good morning, everyone, um, or afternoon or evening, depending on where you are. Um, Kathy did a great job of um, setting up the context in the U.S., so I'm going to jump right into some of the strategies we're using here at the National Education Association, um, a lot of which connect to uh, what Carrie is going to talk about with Education Minnesota. Um, and as Martin noted, Education Minnesota is an affiliate of both the AFT and the NEA, and so they're a great um, case of uh, what happens when um, the initiatives of both unions come together. 
Um, so uh, what I'm going to talk about connects to a lot of what Martin and, um, I'm sorry, Howard and <laughs> Nina write about in the report in terms of connecting unionization um, to professional issues, uh, fighting against uh, deprofessionalization of the profession, and of course, increasing membership. Um, I'm going to talk very briefly but uh, about three different bins of work that we're doing. The first is um, some national level initiatives. Um, traditionally, because NEA is such a large organization, we have um, over 50 uh, state or federal affiliates. Um, a lot of work has happened at that level, but we've done a lot more at the national level in recent years to try and um, build up our um, direct work with members. And so uh, one of those efforts has been uh, what we call the New Ed Campaign or New Educator Campaign, um, where in partnership with our state affiliates, we're really trying to have one-on-one uh, -on -one connections with potential new members, um, making sure that they put a face to the union um, right in their first few days of teaching and that those conversations are not just about um, signing your union card, but also about uh, what issues the new educators are facing in those first few weeks um, on the job and how the union or the association, depending upon which state you're in, can um, help fill those needs. Um, once we have that contact, our um, Center for Communications has put together what they call a digital journey, um, which is a um, tailored set of emails that um, highlight the resources of um, the national union and in many cases, the uh, state affiliate as well. So we're working in partnership with our states on that as well. Um, and we have a website called supported.nea.org, which gathers a lot of resources for both early career educators and um, educators who have more experience um, in schools. Um, a couple of other things that we're doing um, in my center, the Center for Great Public Schools, we're building up a teacher leadership initiative and an early career leadership fellows program. Um, one of the big features of both of those is really connecting professional and union leadership. And so with early career leadership fellows, it's not only how do you start to become a leader in your profession, but what does that mean in terms of becoming a leader of your, in your union as well? And we've been working with um, TURN, which is the Teachers Union Reform Network, in um, making those connections. Um, but then a lot of our work has also been just supporting great initiatives at the state um, and local level. So we have a great public schools fund, which provides money um, the state and local affiliates is a competitive grant program. It's actually very highly competitive. Um, and um, a lot of those programs have led to um, what Howard and Nina write about in terms of our state and local affiliates becoming professional development providers. And so we get a lot of applications to build out programs that will situate a state or local affiliate as a professional hub for its members. Um, and we also have student-centered um, advocacy grants, which connect to um, the bargaining for the common good work that's discussed in the, um, in the case study. And so seeding that kind of work through our local affiliates. And one of the um, things that's required in all of those grants is that um, affiliates who receive them have to share successes and challenges. And so we want to make sure that the work doesn't stay contained within that state or local affiliate, that if it doesn't go well, other people you know, hear about why it didn't go well and, and try and improve on that. If it did go well, we want to make sure that um, our other affiliates can learn from that. Um, and then finally, uh, one of the things that we've done in terms of scaling and spreading the great work of our affiliates is developing organizing institutes. And so we have um, one of the examples is discussed in the case study, uh, the St. Paul Institute, which is a way that um, they'll bring in uh, other local affiliates who are interested in doing that kind of work and talk about how they did it. Um, so we want to, again, make sure that the work spreads um, throughout the association. Um, it doesn't become just a national initiative or just an initiative in St. Paul or an initiative in Minnesota. It's something that um, other affiliates can build on and spread um, throughout the country. Um, and hopefully I have not gone over my time. Uh, I'm ready to hand things off to Carrie. Um, I think, right. do you want to introduce her? Yeah, I'm just going to jump in first because we have had a question through while you've been talking about what programs you've set up in order to develop competencies and capacities among your activists and how have you shared them with other unions. But I think you've already given us part of the answer in your presentation and there is of course more in the study. This is part of what the study and the organizing teaching work is all about that we do want affiliates to be able to share from the USA to Germany to Kenya and all around the world. It's absolutely critical that we're able to share our examples. And I thought the bargaining center that was talked about in the report has created a lot of interest in New Zealand, all over 
uh, in people's response to the report. Um, we've also got specific questions for Larry coming up, who will be next. But now I will uh, pass on to Carrie. Thank you so Hi, much. Carrie. So I first just want to thank Education International for coming to the great north um, and visiting with Education Minnesota. It was a wonderful experience for us. We are a merged affiliate of uh, both the National Education Association and the AFT. And we are so fortunate to have both the capacity and resources that both of those nationals bring to our uh, organization. We are a statewide uh, education union of over 450 locals with 86,000 members, um, teachers, education support professionals, and students. Um, and I think that's helpful context uh, for our work. Really, we have two goals at Education Minnesota around um, both protecting and improving our union. The first is to build strong locals um, we know from the research that most of our members identify most strongly with the work inside of their local uh, union that's closest to their classroom. And so our job is to support the work of those locals in being effective. And the second is to provide pathways to engage our members in both their local and in statewide or national unionism that actually meet them at their interests. So in terms of building strong locals, we've worked to train local leaders to be able to engage members in one-to-one -one conversations around their interests, a little bit around what um, both of our nationals have talked about, um, but really making a personal connection as opposed to you know, simply sending emails or only connecting with executive boards, but rather executive boards really going out and meeting and talking individually with their members. And then on the state side, we've developed a number of new pathways for our members to engage with the union. Um, one around policy initiatives. So we created the Educator Policy Innovation Center uh, to bring groups of teachers together to write policy papers on issues affecting them in their classrooms. And then they've gone on to testify at the legislature to prevent, present those papers at different panels. It's really a way for them to become leaders on a particular issue that they care about. Um, additionally, we uh, have developed um, a number of social justice initiatives, including our FIRE initiative, which is Facing Inequity and Racism in Education, to train teachers who are interested in working on racial equity issues within their classrooms. It has been a stunning success. We've had four or five times more applicants for each one of the programs we've done in that particular initiative than we can handle, uh, which is a wonderful gift. And I think it meets folks at their interest. Um, and then we've also utilized a number of the national programs that, the, that, that both of my uh, colleagues talked about um, inside of Minnesota in order to engage our members. And so between building strong locals and then providing pathways for folks to get more involved on the state or national level, we really believe that we can uh, meet members at their interests and get them involved and make them feel like the union is really representing them. Okay, great. Thanks, Kerry. And Kerry is an unusual AI contributor, so it's great to have a new face and uh, also to be an open organization that allows people to get involved at all the levels of, of what's going on. And it's clear from what you said that teachers writing policy actually within the context of the state, we're not talking about Washington, D.C. We're talking about where the school is, is really, really great to hear. So thank you for that contribution. And Larry, you are going to have to wait a bit because we are going basically alphabetically. We did start with AFT, NEA because they were sandwiched together. But um, next up is Chile. And we have Mario Aguilar. And excuse my Mancunian accent if, um, if my pronunciation isn't quite right. But we have Mario from the Chilean Colegio Profesore who is going to come up now. Hola, buen día. ¿Me escuchas? Hola. Hi, Mario. Muy bien, muchas gracias. Estoy con Marcelo Castillo, que es eh, profesional de nuestro departamento de estudios. Buenos días, un gusto saludarlo. Eh, yo solo puedo hablar en español. Mi inglés no es, muy, no es suficiente para poder eh, hablar en inglés. 
Okay, yeah, in English, if you can, Mario, because um, uh, we don't have Spanish translation in the um, in the webinar here. Okay. Eh, bueno, lo que puedo comentar sobre el tema es que nosotros como Colegio de Profesores de Chile tenemos desafíos eh, nuevos, tenemos eh, una condición social en Chile distinta a la hace algunos años atrás. Eh, Chile es una sociedad que está cambiando mucho en lo político y en lo social y eso pone desafíos para las organizaciones como nuestro colegio de profesores que es el equivalente al sindicato nacional eh, pone desafíos y pone interrogantes, preguntas que, que tal vez no existían antes eh, Chile es una sociedad hoy día mucho más crítica Pregunta si tienes que hacer pausa para la transmisión una sociedad eh, más demandante, más exigente, una ciudadanía mucho más exigente con la élite, con, con los que tienen el poder, crítica, muy crítica de la dirigencia. En Chile se ha instalado con mucha fuerza hoy eh, una, una ciudadanía desconfiada de la élite. La desconfianza en la élite ha crecido mucho y eso incluye a la clase política, a la clase empresarial, a la clase dirigente en general, las instituciones están muy cuestionadas, y eso también toca a los sindicatos, a los gremios, a las organizaciones sociales, y también a los dirigentes sindicales y sociales. Hay una exigencia mucho mayor de parte de, de, de la ciudadanía y de la base social. Nosotros tenemos un movimiento social en Chile muy fuerte desde finales de, desde el 2007 en adelante más o menos, llevamos unos 10 años, con un movimiento estudiantil y un movimiento docente que en los últimos años ha generado fuertes movilizaciones. Y esas movilizaciones y esas demandas eh, han tenido una, una fuerte crítica hacia, hacia la clase política. Eh, el reclamo hoy día es a que los gremios y las organizaciones sociales y los sindicatos tengan cada vez mayor autonomía del poder político. Algo que tal vez unas décadas atrás no era una demanda tan fuerte. Y era muy natural que los sindicatos, por ejemplo, estuvieran muy ligados a partidos políticos. Hoy día eso se cuestiona. Hoy día no se, no se acepta como legítimo que, que el partido político tenga manejo dentro de, de la organización sindical. O pueda eh, conducir el movimiento sindical o social. Eso ya no se acepta. Y eso pone desafíos porque de alguna manera eso rompe las concepciones clásicas de lo que es el accionar del sindicato. Las concepciones más tradicionales, tal vez, de, del siglo pasado. Que a, a su vez no significa que el gremio o que el sindicato deba ser despolitizado. De ninguna manera puede ser despolitizado porque su accionar es político y tiene... Eh, necesidad de actuar en el campo político para defender sus derechos, sus demandas, luchar por leyes, por eh, decisiones que son políticas que, que, que afectan a los profesores y profesoras. En ese sentido, eh, la, la demanda es de un sindicato autónomo, pero cada vez más influyente. Entonces es un desafío importante, no menor. Nosotros venimos de un periodo anterior con una... Nosotros somos un, un directorio nuevo, una conducción One nueva. One more minute, Mario. One more minute. If you can just wrap up, because we're, and I'm going to do a, a very brief translation for our English listeners. Um, can you say in Spanish? Un minuto queda. Ah, un minuto. Yes. Okay. Bien. Thank you. Eh, entonces, eh, ese desafío, nosotros somos una directiva nueva, la directiva anterior fue muy cuestionada por, porque no se le percibía con suficiente autonomía del gobierno y, y, y nosotros de alguna manera hemos llegado a, a, a conducir el sindicato ahora con un, con un discurso de enfatizar la autonomía de la organización respecto al gobierno, respecto a los partidos, que no es lo mismo, quiero ser muy claro en esto, no es lo mismo que un gremio o una organización sindical apolítica o despolitizada. No es eso. 
es un gremio, una organización muy politizada, muy influyente en las decisiones políticas, pero con total autonomía de partidos, de gobierno en general, del poder político. Ese es el desafío y esa es hoy día tal vez nuestra, nuestra característica o nuestro perfil como directiva más claro. Gracias. Okay, Mario. Okay, gracias, Mario. And, and thanks for that Spanish intervention. We weren't quite expecting, but um, we've been lucky enough to have um, one of our Spanish speakers on hand who's translated for us. I'm going to do a very quick translation of what you said for the English participants in the webinar. And if anybody has questions, um, if they come in Spanish, they will be translated into English and we will deal with them as they come. So what Mario talked about is that society is becoming much more demanding, that the situation in Chile is difficult and has become more so as the demands for education and society have increased. The citizenship doesn't trust the elite anymore. And this is not a story just for Chile, but many countries around the world. Um, the political elite has separated from the people. There has been a, a sense in which unions have been touched by this criticism. Um, unions have been questioned. Teachers have mobilized and students have mo mobilized and have become critical of the political class. Today's unions um, have had political autonomy demanded of them. And much like the question before, where how can you work with parties from many different political colors, the issue of union autonomy has been critical in Chile. So there have been issues with unions adjusting, but they have adjusted. And it does not mean that they're not politicized. So to be autonomous as a union doesn't mean that you're not political. I think those points were really well made, Mario. And we have a, a number of questions that have come up as we've gone through that we are going to pick up as we go. So I'm going to go back to Howard because we've got some questions here on the books for Howard that are really, really important in terms of the work. So I'm going to start with one about gender because the question that came through was, could you expand on the gendered aspects of mobilizing for activism? So the demographic shows that it's a predominantly female profession. In what ways have we got gendered responses coming from unions? Right. Uh, I think we need to recognize that unions reflect the structural power inequalities that exist in society. And therefore, uh, if you look at the profile of who does what in particular unions, you will quite often see that uh, what that looks like in the union doesn't reflect what the teaching profession looks like. And I think there's a sort of an awareness of that, but it's not, an e it's not been an easy issue to uh, resolve. What we saw in the study was lots of examples of unions uh, developing much more informal structures around particular issues, uh, which, which may be issues of identity. It may be, it may be gender, it may be ethnicity, it may be sexuality. It may be uh, people's particular disciplinary interests. Uh, it may be some of the issues that people feel particularly strongly about. But what unions were doing was finding ways to connect people through informal networks. Um, I think it was Carrie made the point about connecting the union with people's interests. Sometimes I think we're guilty of imposing on other people what we think their interests should be. And actually what I think we were seeing really good examples of is, is unions uh, bringing people together with common interests and then finding sort of spaces and often quite informal and fluid uh, and very flexible. So people weren't going to long, boring meetings about issues that weren't really very important to them, but people were being encouraged to self-organize around the issues that were important to them. And there were lots of examples. And I think they, those worked really well at drawing people into union activity who might otherwise feel that the union wasn't for them. So you know, these are not easy issues to address, but I think there's some really interesting work of, of that type. They're there in the studies, lots of other examples of them as well. And again, you know, examples that other people can learn from, I think. I think that really resonates with Mario's comments too about relevance. 
And I'm sure many of our Spanish listeners on the webinar will be appreciative of the fact that you spoke in Spanish too, Mario. At this point, I'm going to pass now to our next um, country case, which is back to the European side of the Atlantic. And it is going to be Larry from EIS. So Larry, you're on. Okay. Oh, you have to unmute your mic, Larry. Okay. Yeah, yeah. We're on. Okay, so I was saying uh, I'm going to do my best to speak in English, um, but my Scottish accent may prove a bit of a barrier for some, so my very best English. Um, Scotland is a small country, uh, so we, we don't have problems of scale. We have um, a collaborative approach to education, which involves government as well as the unions and the local authorities and employers. So I recognise that perhaps we are in a more benign situation than uh, many uh, other teacher unions around the country, uh, around the globe. And clearly, you have to respond to the challenges that you face in your particular systems. But from an EIS point of view, and we represent around 80% of Scotland's teachers, we have been very keen uh, to engage members in the professional learning agenda in order to engage them in the life of the union. Um, and we've found it's been very successful. So that, for example, we have trained over 200 what we call learning reps who, uh, who represent the union, but whose prime function is to support colleagues in schools in professional learning. So some of them are also active in the union traditionally, but most of them aren't. But it's a very clear connection between the EIS and members' interests. And we run professional learning conferences, we run programmes, uh, international events, we run collaborations with other uh, organisations. And one of the interesting things is that we quite often get bigger attendances at some of our professional learning events than we do for some of our more agitational meetings. So it's, it's about meeting members where their interests lie. But I would also, uh, oh, two points. Um, we're quite excited uh, to be looking at a new development because um, the International Summit on the Teaching Profession was held in Edinburgh this year. And for those who don't know, that's a joint EI OECD conference where the government and the unions are 50 50. And you have to agree certain outcomes from the conference. And one of the outcomes we've agreed with Scottish Government is that they will support union led professional learning on tackling inequality in education. So, tackling inequality in education is a big agenda for government and for ourselves. And our argument to them was well, we have the expertise, we are the teachers uh, in the classroom. So if you want to make a difference in young people's lives, you should facilitate us to become better at impacting it in the classroom. And they're, they're quite keen um, on potentially providing significant funding to allow that programme to happen, and certainly working at facilitating the meeting. So the CPD agenda, I think, is uh, very important, uh, not just in terms of the profile, but actually in terms of effective teaching in the classroom. Because we are a trade union, but we are also a professional association. Uh, and we want to see good teaching in the classroom. We want to see young people being offered good life opportunities. The other side of it, Martin, uh, if I may, um, is just to be very clear that this focus on professional learning, important though it is, and uh, a direct route to membership though it is, is not at the expense of being a trade union. So, you know, we are still very much committed uh, to, to fighting on issues of pay and, and issues of workload. Um, last year, our secondary school members took action short of strike to address workload concerns. Our college lecturers last year took six days strike action to get equal pay across the college sector. And what was 
the biggest education dispute in, in three years. Uh, and some of our branches have had to take action. So it's not either or, but it's both together when it's appropriate. And actually, uh, one of the benefits uh, is that when we are taking industrial action, uh, it becomes difficult for our opponents to dismiss us as only being interested in pay and only you know being selfish in, 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 in any kind of sense because we can simply point to all the work we're doing with other partners around actually ensuring equity in our schools. Uh, so you know we have a, a counterbalance to the way that governments might try to dismiss action from teachers as just being militant unions when we can say, well, we're militant when we're required to be, but we are also looking at what makes a difference in the classroom. So I, you know, I would say to people who are perhaps reluctant to look at professional learning you know, as, a, as a big area for trade unions, uh, not to see it as a, a counter to the, the more traditional role, but actually to see it as, a, as, a, as, a, as part and parcel of the same thing. We are both a professional body and we are a trade union. And, uh, almost, almost fist and glove, you know. So we will combine them as required, and I think it gives us, in, in a, my, my last point, in our members' eyes, it gives us legitimacy in both arenas. We are looking after their interests on a day-to-day -day basis, but they also know that we are committed to their career objective because they've become teachers because they want to be effective in making a difference. And if we can help them make that difference in the classroom, then that just strengthens our profile with our members. So, you know, together, both sides, uh, uh, both sides of the coin uh, give us the identity that we're looking for in terms of school. Thanks, Mark. It's great, Larry. We've got two questions especially for you, which will be coming in just a second. I'm going to let Howard make a comment, and I'm just checking that Hesban is H17A331. Um, if it is you, then we will try and unmute you after these questions. So Hesban is our rep from KNUT, from the Kenyan National Union of Teachers. We're hoping that he's online, but we're not completely sure. So we'll give that a go when we get to it. So Howard's comment first. Well, just very briefly, and it was, we had a fantastic time when we went to Scotland and, and we saw how the EIS brings that industrial and professional together. And I remember listening to Larry and he, he was talking about how, you know, if teachers lack professional self-confidence, actually that creates the conditions in which, for example, workload rises you know, these things are connected because actually, if teachers have got the professional confidence to say, do you know what, that makes no difference to pupil learning. Educationally, that's not a sound thing to do. Then they've got the confidence to challenge those sorts of initiatives that drive the workload up. If teachers don't have that professional self-confidence, that's when they feel unable to challenge what are often really unhelpful initiatives, but which have the consequence of pushing the workload up so you can't you can't separate these issues out and and actually by through things like professional learning you enhance the professional confidence of the profession and you know you, you make its voice stronger in uh arguing what it's for what, what it stands for and and what it stands against Okay, thanks, Howard. And um, professional learning, as you know, Larry, is an issue very dear to my heart. So it's great to hear you talk about it in a way which brings together that strength that unions have to make a difference. And that by engaging in professionalism, you are not in any way lessening your ability to be industrially effective. Far from it, you are sharpening your edge so that when you go into negotiations with government, you're more able to say, we've done all this work, what are you going to do in order to meet your part of the bargain? So thanks for that. The two questions that have come to you are, what are the challenges in connecting with civil society and building alliances with other social sectors? And what are the challenges in the institutional participation of unions in education policy and what have been the institutional mechanisms that have allowed you to advance, to advance, have your voice and your place in the policy making sphere? So um, you can take them as you wish, Larry. 
Yeah. On, well, on the second one first, uh, you know, we would recognise in Scotland we are in a, a you know a fairly benign scenario. So uh, the Scottish government um, is very uh, is, is very big on social collaboration and partnership. So we don't have to fight very hard to get in the door. I, I remember speaking to colleagues in England who were threatening to take strike action to get a meeting with the minister. And they asked me, what do you do in Scotland? And I said, we, we pick up the phone. So, you know, Scottish culture is generally collaborative. Um, well, it, it doesn't mean, so there wouldn't be an initiative in education in Scotland where the a board was set up that the trade unions were invited to be part of that. It doesn't mean you're compromised because quite often I have been in a situation where I've been the sole critic of something that's been discussed. But you're then able to say, well, I'm taking this back to my executive, to my members, and we may not agree with this. So being involved in the, in the dialogue doesn't mean that you're signed up for the outcome. Uh, so you still have that, that reservation. The other side of it is that we are actually a very powerful voice. So if I'm sitting in a room talking to civil servants, well, I spent 33 years as a classroom teacher. I know what I'm talking about in education. They may have read a book, but I actually know how schools work. So, so we we can shape policy. We can shape policy quite uh, quite clearly in terms of bringing our professional understanding uh, into that discussion. Um, I think that on the on the first question, the around the issue of of challenges, um, we are as a so we are, we are the third biggest trade union in Scotland, and we are part of the Scottish Trade Union Congress, which is the aff uh, affiliation of all the, the trade unions. So we, we play a very clear role in the trade union side of Scottish um, and we work very closely with other unions. For example, there is a big campaign at the moment around addressing the impact of poverty, and they're looking at schools and what can schools do to close the attainment gap. And one of the things we keep saying is, well, you have to look at what social work departments are doing, what, what support are families getting around child minding. So we take it out of the school to talk about our colleagues in other sectors who are also our sisters and brothers in other unions. So that we, you know, we're making a much broader argument. So the, we're, we're not sucked into um, any kind of uh, special treatment for teachers. We, you know, we advocate for teachers and for education. But we also work um, across the sectors with other trade unions and with other partners, so that we are looking at it from a societal point of view, um, rather than just simply a kind of narrow interest. Um, and again, I think one of the things that happens is that you know people respect that we have an expertise in one area, and we respect that others have expertise in other areas. And the the, the, the partnership collaborative approach uh, makes all our voices stronger, because generally speaking, all of the trade unions are on the same side of, kind of seeking social justice uh, for those that we represent. Precise and, and thorough answer. It's clear to me as an Englishman listening to you speak about the way you're operating in Scotland, what Hadrian's Wall is doing and who it's keeping out. So it seems that you've got um, a, a very um, important and hand-in-hand -hand relationship in moving things forward in education. So it's great to hear the success stories. So, so thanks for that, Larry. Um, we do have one more speaker who I'm going to pass to in a little while, which is Dorota in Poland. But first, we're going to deal with some questions on activism. And I will... Um, just repeat for all webinar participants, if you have any questions, we have a little time left and we are going to put as many of them in as possible. So as they come in, we're molding them together and I'm going to give Howard a quick fire for questions here. Oh. So we're going to deal with two first and then we're going to move on to the next two. What have we got to do to address the professional and union identity of early stage teachers teachers in their mid-career and teachers at, their, at the end of their career? And how can unions mobilize teachers in the current context when they have less and less time and in spite of trade unionism being discredited for decades? So some tricky questions there, right. Howard. And I'm conscious time is tight, so some really quick answers. I think in the project we saw lots of examples 
of people, uh, organisations, unions devoting resources to addressing the particular needs of early career teachers. Right, if you think about renewal in a sort of ecological way, the organisation is about, it's about reproducing in a sustainable way. That is not going to happen if you're not drawing in young people into the organisation. So, look, there are examples in the report. I would just say, I think uh, I see more and more unions prioritising this, and I think that's really important. And we can learn from each other. I think there are really great examples of how some unions have really given a space to young people to self-organise, rather than people like me, my age, telling young people how to do it. They don't need people like me to tell them how to do it. What they need is the space to do it for themselves. Uh, but going back to what I said earlier, we also need to recognise that what these pressures are doing to teaching as a career means that it's really difficult for people in the middle and later stages of a career, or you know, or how many people get to those later stages of a career. So I think there's issues about how, as unions, do we prioritise the notion of making teaching a lifelong sustainable career? Because increasingly, it's based on a model which is not expecting people to stay in the profession for a long time. It's actually losing a lot of teachers before they get to the point in their career where they feel they're doing a really great job, because that takes time. It's not, it's not, there's no quick and easy answers to that one. But if the nature of the job is burning people out too quickly, those are the issues that have to be addressed. And, and when unions are taking up those issues, I think that people can, you know, members will engage with that. The second question was how to how to mobilise, wasn't it, I think? Yeah. Uh, and, and again, no easy answer to this, but it is about addressing the issues that are of concern to teachers. In the work that I've done, where I've worked directly with teachers, what they, what they say again and again is the notion about the union being relevant to them. You know, the union uh, addressing the issues that cause them problems in terms of them being able to do the job in the way they want to do it. Um, or, more positively, the union working with them to uh, uh, offer opportunities that are helpful to them in their work. But again, uh, you know, Carrie used the phrase something like the closest to those teachers in their classrooms. And I think you draw people into a connection with the union when they, they see the union on the ground, around about them, addressing the issues that are of immediate concern to them. And that's very often at the moment workload, but it's a whole load of other professional issues which are completely related. Uh, you know, address those issues. Or, and of course, and this is the really important point, if you, if you can tap into the collective power of teachers, if we can mobilise the membership in our unions. It's not just that you're increasing the capacity of the union, you start to decrease the problems that face teachers. Mm -hmm. So you know that gap I was talking about right at the beginning, you're tackling it from both sides. The issue isn't just about, as it were, tackling the problem, it's stopping the problems being problems in the first place. And a, a mobilised profession can do that. Okay, great, thanks Howard. We're gonna pass now to Dorota, a colleague from Poland, who's gonna make some comments on Poland. And then I'm gonna get Howard to talk about Kenya and New Zealand because they were unable to be represented here and Turkey. And we're gonna finish off with uh, another um, few questions that we have here on the books. So we're gonna deal with as many as we can. And it's been great to have engagement from the audience as we've gone. So we'll now pass to Dorota. Hello, dear colleagues. Did you hear me? <laughs> yes. Yes, okay. Uh, thank you very much for invitation. And I'm very sorry because after so many fantastic speakers and uh, native speakers, <laughs> I will be uh, much uh, more slowly. <laughs> so I'm sorry, maybe I need one uh, minute uh, more. <laughs> so, but uh, to be honest, I um, um I would like to uh, uh, say something about our experience uh, in this area. I don't want to talk about the nowadays political situation in Poland because 
it's a very difficult and big problem. So, and I think it's not uh, the time for this. Um, some years ago, we uh, uh, participated in the international project, uh, European project about uh, union education. And we asked uh, during this project, and or we try to answer the question, what does it mean? Uh, what uh, union education is? And it was a very important moment for us. Uh, first of all, uh, uh, we recognize, we in our trade union, that uh, we have some objective as, as a union and we have some objective in our uh, institute because we are very lucky we have such an institute for, uh, for uh, in-service teacher trainings. Um, and we recognize that those uh, uh, goals or those uh, aims are exactly not common aims, that they are very different, that we uh, uh, see uh, uh, the union as something uh, other or the separate thing and education as uh, something separate. And uh, it was the moment when we talked it's not good and it's not uh, uh, such a situation we can accept. So we changed our approach to the union education and now uh, for us the union education is more holistic thing. Uh, uh, I give uh, such an example. When we uh, uh, organize a professional training for our colleagues, uh, for, which should be uh, uh, important and uh, helpful for them at the school level, and there are, for example, training in cooperative work, uh, working or uh, a better understanding of, of nowadays uh, politics, educational politics. It's also the part of a uh, union's uh, 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 policy, because if people can co cooperate uh, in union, they are also able to cooperate in the, uh, uh, the teachers' groups at schools or cooperate with parents. So um, we try to see uh, uh, or compare professional uh, uh, competences and skill with uh, the competences of unionists. And uh, it's really very important because when we organize our program or think about the program for our seminars, we always analyze those uh, 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 aims of, of, of seminars from both perspectives. Uh, so we always try to answer the, the question, if the knowledge or uh, skills which we will try in our union seminar will be helpful for our teacher, the colleagues as a teacher, as a professional or not. And we always try to find those connections between uh, union's goals and uh, professional uh, uh, needs and, and uh, professional competencies. Dorota, I'm just gonna I'm just gonna jump in because um you've actually your English is excellent and you've given us a really good explanation of that link. Um, I'm gonna give you a chance to do any wrapping up comments you wish. We've got um, 11 minutes left on the webinar, so if you want to just wrap up the next 30 seconds, and then we're gonna go through these last few questions, if that's okay. 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 Uh, so uh, uh, what what we what we uh, uh, can uh, add uh, to 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 this conclusion is that we of course very uh, uh, um, uh, very careful uh, analyze all all researchers uh, 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 and surveys outcomes about uh, professional needs of our teachers. And we uh, try to support them. Uh, uh, and uh, of course, we, we, we try to um, uh, eliminate barrier in this uh, uh, union and professional uh, developing. 
Uh, so what, what we try to do, there is uh, the uh, um, uh, organ it, 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 uh, the, the, the direction that we want to organize our uh, uh, seminars uh, for uh, in, in, in the good time, because we know that, for example, the biggest barrier for our teacher is not uh, uh, that, that, it, that they are not able to find time for uh, uh, for seminar. We try. Okay, to, Dorota. Okay. We it's last last sentence. The the financing problem because uh, we try to uh, uh, propose free seminars because we know that it's also a very big barrier for them. Uh, and uh, yes. Okay, thank you. Thank you. Thanks, Dorota. And I appreciate your willingness to work with us around the time constraints, which are very difficult when you're speaking in your third tongue, because I know your German is excellent too. So um, if we can just go to um, the rest of our questions, and I'll wrap up the webinar, we are going to finish at um, the correct time, five o'clock sharp. It's been great to have such an engagement. It's the biggest webinar we've done. So I'd be really interested in your feedback afterwards on how it's been listening to different voices from different parts of the world and whether the case studies have been instructive for you. Um, I will go to these questions now. Could you elaborate, please, Howard, on the new spaces for activism noted in the research? Specifically, are there any concrete examples of this happening effectively in unions already? And I'm going to give you two at a time. So the next one is, how can new teachers be mobilized within unions or be interested in joining a union if they have the feeling that unions are disconnected from their professional realities? Well, that's one between the eyes. So I'll look forward to hearing your response on that. OK, look, the new spaces uh, is about recognizing that, you know, if we think about unions as a sort of traditional organization, quite rule bound, quite bureaucratic, often is many people's experience. I think people are uh, expect these days uh, to, when they're working in those sorts of organizations, to work differently, to work more fluidly. And I gave the example earlier on of sort of informal networks and, and rolling these two questions together. Yeah. Uh, spaces for young teachers to work together, uh, but how unions use social media and actually how you might use technology to connect teachers. So uh, when I was in Kenya, there were really interesting examples of how the union, uh, you know, in this big country where communication is actually quite difficult, but some of the technology allowed them to connect with members in ways that they hadn't done previously. So I think we can look at I think looking at how we use new technology and social media is essential. I think uh, sort of letting go sometimes of some of the bureaucracy and formality to create uh, ways of working that are more accessible and more inviting and more engaging. Uh, and in terms of new teachers, I mean, I, th I think we sort of touched on that earlier, but, uh, you know, it's I, I loved what uh, the colleagues in the US were saying about making one-to-one -one contact because a lot of the work I have done says that you know having talked about electronic communication but the sort of the blanket email or the blanket mailing or whatever it is doesn't make anything like the impact that the personal approach makes and of course personal approaches take time and effort and we think we don't have that time and effort but one of the points I'd want to make about the research is one of the big problems that we face is there's so many things happening right in front of us that we only concentrate on the immediate, almost firefighting type approach. And sometimes sort of investing time in developing people can seem like a luxury that we can't afford. Actually, the key to renewal is investing time in developing the membership. And, uh, you know, it's a bit like mining for gold. It, sometimes it feels like, you know, you, you're not finding anything. But actually, you know, you, you connect with an individual, draw them in, 
And sometimes that, that person may go on to be involved in the union for many, many years, make a massive contribution, you know, marvellous. But you've got to make the connection with people to get them into that place. And I'm not sure we, we do that. There's been great examples today of how people are doing it. And I think we need to think more about how we do that. OK, I'm going to come back to professional realities because I, right. I don't think we did enough on that. Um, we've also had a question which came in for AI about how we're fostering the exchange of experience on strategies and collective bargaining amongst its members. And I will refer to the case which is on the cover of the report, which is New Zealand, who are unfortunately, because it's the middle of the night for them, are unrepresented today. But they did collaborate across two unions, the PPTA and the NZEI, in order to stave off a vicious governmental assault on their funding regime, which was called bulk funding. So I'm going to pass to you, Howard, to make some comments about that. Well, again, we heard earlier from the colleagues in the US how being uh, connected to both the national organisations gives a, sort of an access to a level of resourcing that wouldn't exist otherwise. And I think that shows the benefits of working together. The example in New Zealand is really uh, interesting because you have a union there that represents all the secondary teachers and you have a union that represents all the primary teachers. And on that big issue, that was a threat to both sectors and uh, would have paved the way really for the sort of uh, marketization of the New Zealand public school system. Those two unions sort of absolutely worked as one in the campaign against that. And the government, this was a big, big policy push for the government. The two unions worked together, absolutely hand in glove, uh, did lots of joint activity. Uh, you know, we talk in the report about a union meeting they had with over 3,000 teachers. You know, everything was organised together. And of course, that in itself empowers teachers, because rather than feeling, well, why should I do it? Because they don't agree and we're divided and it's, what, what's the point? Suddenly, the profession is unified. They ran a fabulous campaign and that policy was completely defeated. Uh, you know, the teachers in New Zealand will experience the benefit of resisting that policy for a long time to come. It was the benefit of working together. I mean, it's a basic trade union principle, isn't it? But uh, not always an easy one to enact. Okay. I, think, I think that case was a really good example. Thanks, Howard. We've got one time for one more question and then I'm going to wrap up. So I'm going to go back to that disconnected from their professional realities, and I'm going to go on to the next question, which is, while industrial issues have dominated union work and culture, how do we change that and convince union members of the close links between the industrial and the professional? So it's basically, I'd like you to talk about that in terms of the professional realities that, as Larry pointed out, we experience when you're teaching year 10 last period Friday. And um, it is something which you only know if you've been in that classroom doing that work. Look, uh, you know, what we know is that when teachers mobilise, when anybody mobilises in terms of uh, an industrial context, there needs to be an issue around which they mobilise. And, you know, it can be easy sometimes to identify pay or particular workload issues as that issue. Right. But actually, whenever anybody takes action on one issue, it's almost always because there's a whole load of other issues going on together. And, you know, the point that Larry made, I can remember Paul Galter in New Zealand talking about it. The teacher actually doesn't distinguish between, uh, you know, there's not an industrial side of my job and a professional side of my job as though my brain's in two halves. <laughs> you know, it's work. It's teacher's work. And these things fit together. Uh, so. Uh, you know, I think I think uh, we should be we we shouldn't be afraid of connecting those things uh, and making explicit the links between the profession how professional issues actually drive the industrial issues. Great! I think you'll all join me in thanking very much Professor Howard Stevenson for coming and sharing his wisdom, and for all our colleagues yeah. from around the world who've told us in, in really clear and amazing terms about the experience that they've had in shaping what is a study which is based on our affiliates' experience. 
And I'd like to thank you all for the great engagement we've had. And please do feedback to us. Let us know whether this webinar has been useful to you and whether you would like to see more in the future. Because if you do, then we'll be going about the organizational process of organizing them. It has been recorded and will be available on our website. Thank you so much for coming. Have a great day, evening, um, whatever time you're at, and we'll see you next time. Thanks. Bye. <laughs>